pleasure to have David Dumas come again. I think this is not your first time. Right? Not my first time. No. Uh, so very happy to have him visit again. And he's going to tell us today about limits of cubic differentials and projected shapes. OK, thank you. Um, thanks for the invitation to speak. So everything I'm going to talk about today is joint work with Michael Wolf. And it's uh, maybe the last time I was here, I was speaking about our first paper on this uh, same related circle of ideas. So it's a continuation of our, some things that we proved in our 2015 paper. And uh, so I'll explain the relation and, um, and what our new work is about. This is, I, I would call it work probably not in progress. We think it's done. But um, <laughs> over the summer, we added a little bit to this project and now are writing it up. So there's no paper yet. So I think the first thing that I want to tell you about is um, what I'll call the kalabi cheng yao correspondence. So this will be sort of setting the stage, and then I will state the main theorem. And the main theorem will have some object in it that I haven't defined yet. So then I'll spend uh, the rest of the time just uh, explaining what that object is. Um, and maybe, who knows, maybe I'll get to give you some hints about how the proof goes. But um, without that object in play, it wouldn't make any sense. So what is this kalabi cheng yao correspondence? It dates from about 1975 in a series of papers by by Cheng and Yao that established a uh, conjecture of Kalabi. And this is something that works in any dimension and is a differential geometric statement. I'm going to specialize it to, uh, to dimension two. So what is it? It's a map from uh, c properly convex open sets in the real projective plane. Open sets omega inside of RP2. Maybe I should say it's a map from the collection of those things. And here, properly convex open set, uh, this just means, well, open means open, right? But properly convex, this means it is a bounded uh, convex set in some affine chart, R2, inside of RP2. OK. So it's a map from those to uh, pairs. RC. Uh, so what are these? Where R, let's say um, let, I've named our properly convex open set omega. So R here would be a Riemann surface structure on the open set omega. So it turns it into some simply connected Riemann surface. And C is a holomorphic cubic differential. on the Riemann surface R. So concretely, it is something that looks like C of Z dz cubed in a local coordinate Z on the Riemann surface R. Or abstractly, it is a section of some bundle, um, the canonical bundle of R cubed. OK, so this is not at all the way uh, Chang and Yao phrased what they were doing. Um, and what I'm doing is hiding an object that comes between the open set and this kind of um, Teichmuller theoretic data. I'll just tell you briefly what, what really happens is that um, you go from omega, which is inside of RP2, to a surface inside of R3 of a very special class. So it's called a hyperbolic affine sphere. And this surface then leads to lots of data. You get a Ramanian metric G. G has an underlying uh, conformal structure, and that's actually R. Um, but then you can also get, from the surface in R3, you get the associated flat connection on the trivial R3 bundle over S, which just restricts the flat connection of R3. And the Ramanian metric G gives you its own levi civita connection, and these two connections have a difference that is some kind of tensor. You can raise and lower indices, and you get from that a cubic differential. OK, so, if, so what Cheng and Yao were doing is really studying the 
uh, construction of one of these things, an affine sphere and the associated differential geometry. And the key property of this construction is that it is natural with respect to the action of the projective group, which in three dimensions is just uh, isomorphic to SL3R on RP2. So if two domains in RP2 are projectively equivalent by a real projective transformation, then the associated data, the Riemann surfaces, are then biholomorphic, and the cubic differentials are related by that biholomorphism. Okay. Um, okay, what else do I want to say about this correspondence is that uh, it's very difficult, <laughs> right? So, so it involves the solution of an intimidating type of partial differential equation, a mange and pair equation, equation on um, omega. So some kind of fully nonlinear second order partial differential equation that involves the determinant of the matrix of second derivatives. Uh, that equation is what says that this surface is of this special class uh, from which you get all of the rest of this data. I'm not saying anything about what affine spheres are or why you would care about them. I would just say that it's already interesting to have a projectively natural map from what I think of as a highly non-holomorphic world, like the projective geometry of RP2, into the world I'm more comfortable in, is the Riemann surface and holomorphic differential world. So it maps this into Teichmoy theory. The motivating question for um, all the work that I've done with Mike Wolf on this is to understand this correspondence a little bit better for special classes of things in the domain or things in the codomain. So questions you could ask are, if you have a favorite family of convex sets in RP2, what are the corresponding Riemann surfaces and cubic differentials? Or you could ask, if you have a favorite class of Riemann surfaces and cubic differentials, what are the corresponding uh, properly convex sets? Now, I haven't said anything about this map being um, you know, whether it's injective, surjective, whatever. And in complete generality, I don't think, uh, I don't think that anything like that is known. But I do want to highlight two instances in which you get bijective correspondences from, from this. So the first is that theorem, so I'm going in inverse historical order um, by telling you first about the theorem from 2015. This is. Mike Wolf and myself, and the paper was published in 2015, which says that uh, this correspondence, which I guess I'll start calling the CCY correspondence, correspondence gives a uh, homeomorphism, surely a diffeomorphism, though, though in fact we don't prove that in this paper, um, gives a homeomorphism between two spaces. So one would be, uh, so let me, let me say it this way. This is going to look a little strange that I chose to call it d plus 3. But uh, p d plus 3, this is going to be the space of convex polygons in RP2. RP2 with d plus 3 vertices or size. And uh, it's, it's like a moduli space, so I mean up to the action of SL3R. Two polygons are projectively equivalent. They're the same point in this space. Uh, it gives homeomorphism from that space to, now I'll just tell you what the cubic differentials you get are. You get exactly uh, C sub D. This is the space of polynomial cubic differentials on the complex plane. polynomial of degree d uh, cubic differentials on the complex plane. So things that just look like p of z dz cubed, where p is a polynomial of degree d. Okay, And what is the natural notion of isomorphism on this side to make it some kind of moduli space? You look at all the holomorphic automorphisms of the complex plane. So z goes to az plus b, where a is a non-zero complex number. So this acts on such things by uh, pullback of the cubic differentials. 
most of the work in this is actually constructing this map, which maybe I'll call it alpha, and uh, say that constructing alpha a map that goes from a cubic differential to all this other data along the way, but eventually gives you a, a convex polygon in RP2. Constructing alpha involves the key step that's most of the work in our paper, uh, solving a, a nicer, or I don't know, nicer, easier, a quasi-linear partial differential equation, which is an instance of the self-duality equation of Hitchin. And there's some kind of rank three Higgs bundle hiding behind the scenes, but it will remain hidden. Um, so, so okay. Um, most of most of what goes into alpha is constructing a solution to an equation and then some estimates for that equation that will say that uh, you get a convex domain from this cubic differential that is actually a convex polygon. Okay, so that's. What, so what inspired that work? I'll tell you about another theorem from around 2000. So here's another theorem. So this theorem was proved independently by Francois Labrie and by John Lofton. Uh, around the year 2000 in both cases. And it says that the this same correspondence gives a, uh, yeah, well, at least homeomorphism. Though I, though I think that, I think that it, it it may, in fact, be shown in, in um, Lavery's paper that this is a diffeomorphism. But I'll just conservatively state it as a homeomorphism between two moduli spaces of a very similar flavor, P of S. So this will be, uh, so let S be what I imagine it always is in the seminar, a compact surface of genus G greater than or equal to 2. Is that accurate? It's usually that. Uh, so then P of S is going to be the space of the moduli space. Well, I've been omitting the word moduli. The space of convex RP2 structures. On this compact surface S. And what is such a thing? It's uh, where you have a subgroup of SL3R, a discrete group. You have omega properly convex and gamma invariant such that omega mod gamma is a surface of type S. Okay, so that'll be my, I guess it'll never come up again, but that'll be my working definition of what a convex RP2 structure on a surface is. It's when you have one of these properly convex domains that is highly symmetric, there is a huge countably infinite group that will end up being isomorphic to the fundamental group of the surface acting on it, and the quotient is of type S. Okay, so that uh, map, you can apply the kalabi chang yell correspondence to this, and the first thing you notice is that if you apply that correspondence to a domain that has a lot of projective symmetries, you have to get a Riemann surface and a cubic differential on it that has, that is, um, invariant under a big group of biholomorphisms of the surface. Uh, so in fact, what I'll now state is what you get when you take the quotient to get a compact Riemann surface and a holomorphic cubic differential on it. So that's going to be uh, C of S, and this is the bundle of holomorphic cubic differentials um, on Riemann surfaces of type Yes. So I guess I mean it's, wh why do I say bundle here? I mean this is a set of pairs. RC, slightly different use of RC than right there, is that where R is a Riemann surface, 
homeomorphic to S, and C is a holomorphic cubic differential on R, and you can project that down to just R, which you, we think of as a point in the moduli space of Riemann surfaces of type S. Okay, so this is a, a holomorphic vector bundle over the moduli space. So what do you mean you're using RC differentials? Oh, just that um, the RC that would appear here would actually be the universal cover of, of this one. Um, so maybe, maybe the better way to write it would be it's uh, R mod gamma, C mod gamma. Now it's still R mod gamma. Yeah. So then you get RC from the Kalabi Cheng Yao. They are invariant under group action. Then you take their quotients. OK. So, um, so this is a really interesting way of viewing the space of convex RP2 structures, which had been studied. Uh, as a family of geometric structures by lots of people, Choi and Goldman uh, among them. And it was already known that um, the, topology of, the topology of this space was already known. But this gives a completely different coordinate system for it, if you like. It relates it to complex analytic objects. I should also say that all the work here is in constructing the inverse map, which is given a holomorphic cubic differential on a Riemann surface to construct all of the uh, affine sphere data and show that you get a convex RP2 structure out of it. And that also involves solving the, the same kind of self-duality equation now on, now on a compact surface. OK, so, the, so that result about highly symmetric domains inspired us to study the corresponding question about the simplest possible domains in RP2 that are convex, which would be those that have finitely many sides that are polygons. OK, so now the main theorem. Um, so our main theorem uh, glues these two together in some way. That says you can obtain the, these convex polygons and polynomial cubic differentials as limits of these convex RP2 structures or cubic differentials on compact Riemann surfaces, and those are compatible limit constructions. It's only a subsequential theorem, uh, so let me, let me state what it's about. So let um, Rn and Cn now be a, a sequence in this bundle of holomorphic cubic differentials on Riemann surfaces of type S be a sequence. with, we're interested in the case where Rn, the sequence Rn is contained in a compact set inside of the moduli space. So the Riemann surfaces might be changing, but they're not changing too much. They remain in the compact set. And uh, so then I guess the picture I would make for it is moduli space maybe looks like this. So we're inside of some compact set K. Over this set K, we have all of the cubic differentials over Riemann surfaces that live inside of K. And I want to say that we're actually going to infinity in the vertical direction. So I'll just write that as uh, Cn goes to infinity. Okay, but uh, to make that precise, you'd want to I don't know, locally trivialize it over a limit point of the surfaces Rn or something. Or you could put a norm on the vector bundle, and it would just be that the norm goes to infinity. But this is well defined as long as the Rn are in a compact set. It doesn't involve any choices. Now, let Pn be a sequence of base points inside of the surfaces Rn. OK, then after passing to a subsequence, Uh, we have the following, that um, if omega n is the convex domain in RP2 associated to RNCN by, I guess, uh, the Labry Lofton theorem. If we consider that not just as a, a 
domain in RP2 with no extra data, but as a domain with a marked point, omega npn, that this sequence of pointed convex sets in RP2 converges to uh, omega infinity, p infinity, where omega infinity is a convex polygon. Uh, p is a point of omega infinity. And uh, that's, okay, so I could stop there, but our real interest in this problem is relating it to the statement about polynomial cubic differentials. We can do that. So in fact, omega infinity is the image under this map alpha that appeared in, in our work on um, polynomial cubic differentials, the map that takes a polynomial cubic differential and constructs a polygon. This omega infinity is associated with a certain polynomial cubic differential chi, where chi is the local limit as n goes to infinity of the sequence of cubic differentials Cn, well, the sequence of cubic differentials Cn on the Riemann surfaces Rn at the sequence of points Pn. Okay, so this is uh, some polynomial cubic differential on the complex plane. Okay, what do I mean by this? Okay, what, what I mean by this is what I will now explain uh, for 15 or 20 minutes. Okay, but it, it's, at least the name suggests the correct thing, that this is a construction that takes a sequence of Riemann surfaces that are not changing very much and a sequence of cubic differentials that are going to infinity and tries to extract some kind of limit from them even though as cubic differentials on a compact surface there is no limit does that by looking very close to the base points Pn. So it's truly a local construction. And it kind of blows up a small neighborhood of Pn to a very big disk in the plane so that you get convergence of these differentials to a polynomial on the complex plane. So if you do that, and I'll outline that construction next, you get a polynomial out of it that you could predict just by looking at this conformal data. And our theorem is that the convex polygon associated to that polynomial is exactly the limiting shape of the domains in RP2 corresponding to those projective structures you started with. Okay, I did not explain this arrow, uh, so I probably should. Um, so this, this arrow is, maybe I should say here, I don't know, I'll put a star here. Okay, so star, uh, here we use pointed convergence up to SL3R. So the definition of that is that uh, omega n pn converges in this sense to omega p if there exists a sequence of projective transformations such that the images of the domain's omega n closure under those projective transformations converge in the Hausdorff topology of closed subsets of RP2 to uh, the closure of omega. And so, so far, uh, P has not come into this at all. We, s we want this convergence to be so that P kind of remains in the middle. So that's, it's enough to just require that P should be an interior point of omega, not a, no, it should actually lie in omega rather than being on its boundary. So let me say another word about this notion of convergence because it's a little bit weird. Oh yeah, um, that's and, thanks, A-N-P-N, it converges to P. 
Okay, so all three of those are needed. Uh, this kind of convergence uh, can actually be interesting uh, even for uh, omega n uh, constant and equal to omega 0 for all n. So I'll just draw a little cartoon picture of that. Uh, okay, so you could take some kind of ice cream cone domain. So let's call this omega 0. And a sequence of points in it uh, whose limit is in the closure of omega 0, not in the interior. Well then, SL3R is this huge non-compact group. And so we could apply some element of SL3R to this domain and try to um, turn it into a domain in which some, se some element of this sequence, you know, maybe P, P2, P3, P1000 or something, instead of being very close to the boundary, is close to the middle of some other domain. So we can convert this using uh, AN to something that looks more like this. Um, what I have in mind here is that there's a diagonal subgroup of SL3R that fixes any three points in RP2 and thus the triangle. And so what you could do is, if this domain really has two edges that form a vertex in its boundary, you could have a projective transformation that fixes that triangle pointwise and moves these points that are approaching one vertex back into the very center of that triangle. Uh, so you can make it look like this, but the cost is that there's going to be some violent operation done to the rest of the boundary. And so it might end up looking something like that. And then the limit could actually be a triangle with a point at the center. Okay, so this could be omega infinity and p. Or I guess I just called it omega convergence. So as n goes to infinity, the boundary would be more and more collapsed toward the third edge of the triangle, and the limit would just be a triangle with a point inside. Okay. Um, So let's talk about the local limit construction. Yeah, here's a picture should I have in my head for a cubic differential? Like for a few and quadratic differentials, I think like these foliation. Yeah, Is yeah. A... Well, I always say it's just 50% more differential. <laughs> so then. Um, <laughs> So just picture what you're picturing, but 50% more. No, um, a, uh, a quadratic differential, I, I always picture as a pair of orthogonal foliations on the surface. And I, the picture you should have in mind for a cubic differential that most naturally generalizes this is that it's three families of curves that are at 120 degrees to each other at every point. And they no longer necessarily form foliations uh, because what can happen is the, the one at this angle can later come back and intersect itself. But it's a local decomposition of the tangent bundle into three, um, three rank one sub bundles. Why is that the picture? Well, um, so just like in the quadratic differential case, you get this picture by taking a local holomorphic square root of your quadratic differential Q. And considering uh, the integral of that local holomorphic one form as a map from the Riemann surface to C, and then you pull back the foliation of the complex plane by vertical and horizontal lines by that map, what you would do here is you would take the cube root of your cubic differential. There would be three of those locally, and uh, you would pull back, say, the horizontal lines on C under one of those local primitives for cube root. And then there must be like zeros. Yeah, there are zeros, and at, so at a zero of a cubic differential, what you get is what you take when you take this picture and you cut out a third of the plane under this picture, and you glue some number of those together around a vertex. At a simple zero, it would be you glue four of those together. I don't trust myself to try to draw a picture of that, but, but I think you get the idea that you take four Ah, you know, third planes that all have this kind of local foliations picture, and you glue them around a vertex. Yeah, that's the, the ge geometric picture of a cubic differential. Yeah, uh, I never said anything about why, why d plus 3, but it's directly related to, what, to your question. If you consider the cubic differential z squared dz cubed, that corresponds to having five 
third planes all glued around a vertex. And so it has this kind of five-fold symmetry. In fact, this is invariant under the map z goes to zeta z, where zeta to the fifth is equal to 1. So if you pull this back by uh, primitive fifth root of unity, you get the same thing because you have two zetas here and three zetas here when you take the derivative. And so this actually corresponds under our map alpha to the regular polygon, uh, to the regular pentagon. Um, so if you draw if you draw the foliation picture for z squared dc cubed, you'll see it has this beautiful five-fold symmetry and it somehow reminds you of the corresponding polygon in RP2. OK. OK, so let's talk about the local limit construction, because that's And say that's the key construction and is half, half the work. Half of it is in making the local limit construction, and then the other half is showing that the limit that you get has the right properties. But they're, they're closely related. Um, OK, so let me say some properties that it has to give you a flavor for what it does. Uh, the first property would be that it is local. In other words, it's uniquely determined uh, by, the by the sequence of restrictions, Cn restricted to Un, where Un is a sequence of neighborhoods of Pn. In fact, what I'm going to make my life a little bit simpler. I'm going to say from now on, Rn, Cn, Pn is actually just going to be R C N P for simplicity. Uh, so while the construction works in the generality of a sequence of points on a sequence of surfaces with a sequence of cubic differentials, you can already see all the interesting stuff that happens, or all the stuff that happens anyway, uh, by fixing the Riemann surface and the point and just looking at a sequence of cubic differentials on one Riemann surface. So let's do that. And then the, let's just say it's local in the sense that if you just look at Cn restricted to a fixed neighborhood of the point P, that will determine the limit. Um, Another property that it has is that it gives what I think of as the right answer in the ray case. So let Cn be Rn times some fixed cubic differential C hat, where C hat is a, some fixed cubic differential, and where Rn is a sequence of positive scalars that goes to infinity. So you just take multiples of a fixed cubic differential. Then the local limit as n goes to infinity of this sequence is just z to the d dz cubed, where d is the order of vanishing at p of c hat. So this is supposed to reflect the local picture of the differential. And I'm saying if the differential is just bigger and bigger copies of the same one, and you're looking at a point p, the only invariant is the order of vanishing of the cubic differential at p. And the polynomial you get is z to the d dz cubed. Maybe I should add property 0 is that the answer that is almost well defined. OK, so I don't mean to say that the output is literally a polynomial. It's actually. The result is an equivalence class up to the action of the automorphism group of C, defined up to um, Z goes to AZ plus B. So it's exactly, the result is exactly the kind of thing that you can feed into that map alpha that I defined before, an equivalence class under the automorphism group. So. Um, so here, this means something equivalent to z to the d dz cubed under an automorphism of the complex plane. OK. Um, so that's almost it. Let me add one more thing. So uh, for, given uh, Cn that goes to infinity, you can pass to a subsequence. So that you write Cn as 
a scalar times some cubic differential that's in the unit ball in the vector space of cubic differentials, which is a finite dimensional vector space. So let's call that C n hat. The unit ball is compact, and everything is subsequential. So you may as well pass to a subsequence so that those converge. So you can take this Cn to be Rn times Cn hat, where Cn hat actually converges to uh, maybe C hat infinity, some limit cubic differential. So you could call that the projective limit of the sequence. Uh, so this is a sequence that isn't quite a ray, but we're saying it's projectively asymptotic to a ray. They look like large multiples of things that are approximately C hat infinity. OK, so in this case, which is, is like the general case after you pass to a subsequence, there is a, a, a degree that you could attach to the problem. You could look at the order of vanishing at the point P of this projective limit C hat infinity. And in the array case, C hat infinity would just be C hat, and this would be the degree D. And what's true in general is that is an upper bound for the degree of this uh, local limit chi. Um, I don't think I've written chi recently, so I'll just say the degree of the local limit polynomial is less than or equal to that. So let me say something about why it would be less than or equal to. Uh, no, CNs are, uh, live on a compact surface Rn. Yeah, or just R, actually. So R has some cubic differential on it. The cubic differential is growing, is going to infinity. Uh, but you have a base point that you're interested in. So the idea is to select a little neighborhood of R. And a coordinate, well, the first thing that you could do is choose a local coordinate around the point P. Uh, that maps to, say, an epsilon disk in the complex plane. And then what you get is a huge cubic differential on an epsilon disk. Those do not converge in any meaningful sense. But what you can do, thanks to the magic of covariant tensors, is consider a dilation of the plane. So if you, um, this is opposite what vector fields do, right? If you have a vector field on a little domain and you blow up the domain a little bit, the vectors just get longer. But if you have a differential on a little disk, that's kind of like an amount of mass distributed throughout the disk. If you make the disk much larger, the mass is now more diffuse. So you can actually arrange for this huge cubic differential on an epsilon disk to be a bounded differential on a much larger disk. And that's where the local limit construction is going to happen. So let me give you um, it's a, just a quick sketch of what's going on. Maybe I'll do it this way. Lots of mass, lots of mass, and then approximately unit mass. So let me illustrate how that works in the, in the ray case precisely, and then how you handle the general case in the last few minutes. OK, so that was the, if that was the overview, then this is the actual um, construction, which involves dilation. Uh, first, in the ray case. OK, so we're, um, we're back to this sequence Cn that we write as Rn Cn hat, where Cn hat converges to C hat infinity. And these are everything that I've written on the board so far is in the cubic differential space of a fixed Riemann surface R, and P is a point of R. So now we can choose a local coordinate as here, a local coordinate Z. Uh, in which um, p corresponds to, to 0 in the complex plane. And so that in this coordinate, c hat infinity is z to the d dz cubed. This is just the local canonical form for a holomorphic function. Right? If it has order of vanishing d, then you can write it in some local coordinate as just z to the d. So we do that. Uh, then what can we say about Cn? Cn would then be expressed in that same local coordinate as um, 
Oh, I'm sorry. I skipped, a, I skipped ahead. I'm not doing the ray case here. <laughs> I was doing the general case. OK, so let me, let me correct. The ray case is where they're all multiples of c hat. OK, then c hat is e to the d dz cubed. But then cn, not writing anything particularly complicated here, cn is rn times that. All right, so these don't have a limit. But here's the idea. Now let's change coordinates to w, which w is going to be some constant that depends on n, lambda n, times z. So I would call lambda n the scale factor. And this is, so this idea is what I'm calling dilation. So what you get out of this is that, so dz is then lambda n inverse dw, and z is lambda n inverse w. So you substitute these, and you get that cn is rn. And then you'll get d factors of lambda n inverse from the z's, and you'll get 3 from the dz's. So you get lambda n to the d plus 3 with a minus sign, w to the d, dw cubed. So this suggests a value that you can choose for lambda n so that in this w plane, in the local coordinate w, you do have locally uniform convergence to a polynomial. So choose lambda n to be uh, what it is so that this is 1. Right, let's just make it a monic uh, polynomial in the limit. Choose lambda n to be rn to the 1 over d plus 3. Then uh, cn converges locally uniformly to the polynomial differential w to the d dw cubed. Yes, but on different domains. <laughs> so this, uh, this coordinate map is only local. So it goes to an epsilon disk in the z plane, which means it goes to a lambda n epsilon disk in the w plane. So I would say that, yes, they're constant, but, they're, but they are, that formula is valid on larger and larger sets that exhaust the plane. So it really is locally uniform convergence in the complex plane of a sequence of differentials that have different domains. OK. So what happens in general? Um, so. so in general, you can play the same game, but you, you do what I wrote first. Rn cn hat, cn hat converges to c hat infinity. Uh, and you choose z so that the limit in the projective sense is expressed as z to the d dz cubed. Then how would you express cn? Uh, well, if we're willing to shrink our domain a little bit, then we know that cn, which is a multiple of something close to c at infinity, will have uh, d zeros near z equals 0. But they're not at the origin. They're just close to the origin. So we can write it as Rn times a product of factors z minus uh, zn, the ith 0 from i equals 1 to d, and then times some kind of remainder function q. And so this is where q is holomorphic and nowhere 0. Uh, it's actually qn, and qn uh, converges uh, locally uniformly to 1 as n goes to infinity. So let me make a picture associated with this. In the ray case, the picture is as boring as it could be. We have a 0 of multiplicity d for every n. And there is this issue of which coordinate system you're using, but let's ignore that. Here, what we have instead is a bunch of zeros maybe of different multiplicities. 
And as n goes to infinity, they're all heading toward the origin. So this is kind of a picture of uh, a local picture of Cn. So that looks a little bit like the picture of the zeros of a polynomial that's very close to um, very close to z to the d, dz cubed. However, we still need to do this kind of dilation procedure to kill this leading coefficient rn. And there's a complication. So let me explain the complication. Let's try what we did before. Right? Let's just try let w be lambda n z and write the same differential in those coordinates. So then cn would become rn. Oh, did I put a dz cubed here? Yeah. There will be a lambda n to the minus 3 coming from the dz cubed. And then we'll get qn of lambda n inverse z. And then we'll get this product, product of z, which is lambda n inverse w minus z n i from i equals 1 to n, uh, i equals 1 to d, d w cubed. OK, so this is the expression for cn. If we wanted to try to do the same thing that worked in the ray case, what the analog of, of having that lambda n to the minus d would be factoring out lambda n inverse from each of these d factors. So let's do that. And I'm going to just erase rather than rewrite this whole expression. So if you factor out lambda n inverse from all of those, you would get lambda n to the negative d plus 3 times this. And now you would get w minus lambda n times z n i. And now there's a problem. If you want to ensure that this leading coefficient remains bounded, then you should take the lambda n to be of order rn to the 1 over d plus 3. However, when you do that, it's no longer clear that these, mono, that these binomials that appear are going to converge to just w. Because lambda n, which is going to infinity, is multiplied by z n i. And those are these zeros that are all going to the origin. So there's some kind of competition here. Who wins? And the answer is, it could be anything. It could be that all of these go to infinity. It could be that all of them go to 0. Or it could be that some of them remain bounded and some go to infinity. So that's where this loss of degree comes from. Sorry, I guess I have one minute. So let me just tell you that um, so the lemma is that there exists a unique k between 0 and d so that if you choose the scale factors to be rn, OK, so this is going to be something to the power 1 over k plus 3. And if k is equal to d, that'll be it. But then you have to add another factor here. You take the product of the norms of all the other zeros from i equals k plus 1 to d of norm zn i. So that this scale factor gives a monic polynomial limit of degree k. So in other words, you may have to adjust your scale factors a little bit. And as a result of adjusting them, you can no longer guarantee that all the zeros are captured. Some of them may wander off to infinity because they go to 0 more slowly than lambda n goes to infinity. But allowing those to escape, what remains converges to a monic polynomial. And that is the definition of the local limit, which I won't write now. But the local limit is the monic polynomial that has the limits of lambda n times z n i as its zeros. OK, so I think I'll stop there.
limiting to like Union Jack. Limiting to the British flag. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So I think I know some work that's like that, and it may be what you're you're referring to. That work is about the um, there is a Finsler metric on the domain omega associated with the convex RP2 structure. That's the Hilbert metric. And I, so I know some work that is about the limiting geometry of those Hilbert metrics as the convex RP2 structure is going to infinity. It's, it's not unrelated to this. The statement I would make that I'll conservatively say we conjecture this because we haven't written a proof, but we believe this to be true, is that this polynomial cubic differential that you get, this limit chi, that if you, if you turn it into a Euclidean metric by taking it to the power absolute chi to the two-thirds, this is like the flat metric associated to a cubic differential, that that metric on C is a pointed Gromov-Hausdorff limit of the metrics that you get on the compact surfaces corresponding to the cubic differential CI, CN. So that this is a Gromov-Hausdorff limit of um, the metrics absolute CN to the two-thirds on R. Okay, so I'll call that a conjecture. So this would say, this would be another sense in which it's a local limit. It's, um, it's a pointed Gromov-Hausdorff limit. So points that, whose distances are going to infinity under this procedure, you just forget about them and you take the things at finite distance. So they, they are also characterizing Gromov-Hausdorff limits, but of Hilbert metrics, not cubic differential metrics. Not, no, no, <laughs> no. Um, may not work for one forms, actually I forget. But for uh, this local limit construction is if you have a sequence of holomorphic differentials of fixed order, uh, holomorphic differentials of order L, I don't know, like things like DZ to the L, on a compact family of Riemann surfaces. This will construct a monic polynomial limit associated to them. Yeah. Now, the, put, the rest of the theory of the work is for, is for cubic differentials. Yeah, that's right. It seems natural to guess that if you take these local limits for differentials of some other order, that that gives you a meromorphic Higgs bundle on P1 with a polynomial, with a polynomial holomorphic differential as the determinant of its Higgs field, and that's the limit of a sequence of associated Higgs bundles on the compact surface. So if you translate this statement about projective structures into a statement about rank three cyclic Higgs bundles that are in the Hitchin section, there would be a corresponding natural guess to make for any order L, but we do not prove that. 